Are we good for release? I'll be good for release. Release, copy that. All stations are circled past the transfer. Copy. This is an audio slate for dive H2018. UTC time is 190505. Mark. All stations, Atlanta is clear of Nautilus. Copy. Jesus, dive, dive, dive.
Uh, control deck, all stop, 5 zero. Copy, all stop. Of control. Aloha, good morning. Welcome to Nautilus. Welcome aboard. We're great to have you here. We are beginning our descent. This is dive 2018. We're on the McCall Seamount. My name is Devin. I am your science communications fellow here aboard the ship. I'll be on your 8 to 12 watch as we do some exploring of the western side of the McCall Seamount. We have previous exploration exploration on the eastern side that was explored around 2016. So our goal is to explore the west side, a site that's not yet been seen, in hopes of seeing some very interesting biology, hopefully some some sharks. We know that they were sighted on the eastern side. We might get some small sharks, large corals, as we work up the sub-peak in the saddle of the seamount. This will be an 11 hour dive with our maximum depth of 1,593 meters, about 5,226 feet. We have our wide field camera array system working on this dive, hoping to get some more photogrammetry and great images. We've been able to piece together some amazing images to uh, create a 3D venture of the seafloor mount that we'll be able to use in technology for virtual reality that you'll be able to actually be a part of the seafloor as we see it. Our Norbert map mapping system will be well working as well. Lots of interesting technologies on board. Lots of interesting people on board. Our science party line is open, nautiluslive.org. Feel free to chime in if you have questions, anything that you'd like to have answered. We would love to be able to interact with you and get you the answers to those questions. I had someone write in earlier about how interesting it is to listen to everyone talk and troubleshoot Herc during the pre-dive, making sure that all of the pieces, parts, and components that make their technology so awesome are properly functioning. Everyone really does work well together. One mission, one goal, great photos. as we descend down the water column. See the beautiful colors there? Not always a lot going on, but I know the couple of ascents that we've had in the past couple of dives, we've been uh, inked by some squid. It's been quite interesting to see. Never know what you will see. It's always worth watching.
We have a scoop on board, hoping to be able to possibly get a couple of samples with her today. Front row, are you guys ready to do an introduction? Are you guys at a point where you can do that? Johan? Yeah, I think we're doing good. Good morning. We're nice and stable. Good morning. Uh, I guess I'll start off. Hey, everyone. My name is Johan Becking. Um, I'm a graduate student, a PhD student at the University of Rhode Island uh, in ocean engineering. And on this cruise, I'm working as a navigator um, for this shift. Uh, just to give you guys and the pilots a little rundown of what this dive will look like, we're dropping down around waypoint three, which is about halfway up this, uh, this seamount on top of the McCall seamount. And yeah, the first step is we're gonna settle around 30 meters above bottom and Norbert down to waypoint two and then waypoint one and then make our way back up past those points and up until the top of this little mound here. Uh, as we come down, I'll probably back the ship up if you guys are comfortable with that and try to land us more on waypoint three. Great. Um, yeah, looking forward to seeing some cool things. The previous dives have reported uh, vertical walls, small sharks, and large corals, so it should be pretty interesting. It should be. I'm hoping that we can see some biology around there too. I keep missing all the good stuff, six gills, stingrays, all of that stuff is happening on other shifts, but I'm watching from below, so I'm still, still a part of it, but it is exciting to see when you're back behind the controls. Well, we'll try to find some good stuff on the shift. Sounds good. Uh, I'm Robert Waters. I'm sitting in the Herc seat. I'm the ROV lead on this cruise. Uh, my shore side job is OET's facilities manager and ROV engineer. And uh, yeah, on to Human. Hey, my name is Human Moeen. Uh, I'm an ROV engineering intern and I'm piloting Atalanta on this expedition. Uh, Come on, you're really soft. Is it? Sorry, can you hear me? Is that better? No, you might have to speak up a bit. I think you sound fine. Are we, Let good? me see if you. Yeah, you sound yeah. good. All right, maybe okay. it's good. <laughs> okay, well, yeah. So I'm Human Mowing. I'm a RV engineering intern and pilot for Atalanta this trip. And uh, at home, I'm a mechanical engineering master's student at the University of Southern California. How has it been for you on this expedition so far? Uh, it's been really fun. It's been a new experience. Uh, it's fun exploring and seeing all these new things. I miss my cats. But oh, <laughs> me too. Me too. I think they might have to extend a, a pet policy for the next interaction maybe at least one someone be able to bring one small or large i'd be okay with that too yeah i think it'd really boost morale <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> what robert you don't think that's a good idea yeah no no <laughs> i think bob's not a big fan either <laughs> uh oh okay On to video. On to video. Your Hi. favorite spot. Uh, I am Pete Thorderson. I am uh, running the video systems uh, inside of the control van and uh, primarily Zeus um, on Hercules. And I'm responsible for all of the recording systems, um, zoom and focus of Zeus. And occasionally I'll go over to Ad Atlanta, Ad Atlanta and play around with its camera. And then, um, yeah, I'm a broadcast engineer um, by trade. I have a geotechnical engineering background uh, from a long time ago and another life. And uh, just an awesome experience to be on the ship. It is. It really has been. I will say there has been pets aboard ships. 
I had a board a salt ship? Water, I had a saltwater aquarium on uh, Atlantis. Oh, nice. <laughs> S specimens that you collected <laughs> while diving? Unfortunately, the the crew had a bad habit of taking things out of the seawater strainer and throwing them in my tank. And oh. They, and that they would tend to Didn't mostly it? crabs, and they would destroy the coral. Yeah. I was not very happy with them doing that. Yeah. Okay, so fish tank's bad idea. Well, fish tank's okay. <laughs> <laughs> People throwing random things in there is not. That's the bad idea. There you go. There you go. Our front line has completed their introductions. They are the hands-on, making, making sure that this operation is uh, smooth and that each one of the pieces of the equipment are working properly. All eyes always on. And then we have our back row. Kristen, good morning. Good morning. I am Dr. Kristen Mitchell, and I work for the Office of Naval Research uh, on their uh, internship programs and their in-house laboratory programs. Um, I work with about 50 different labs across the country, um, and our application is currently open for high school, undergraduate, and graduate students for paid internships at one of those labs across the country, one of the Navy labs across the country. Um, so applications are open now. Get your applications in. You have yeah. a few more days left. Yes, and we were talking yesterday. You've seen quite a uh, uptick in the amount of uh, hits on the application site. That's I, exciting. I ab absolutely have, yeah. It, it has uh, increased since I've, we've been talking about it here on the Nautilus. No kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's Unexpected working. Unexpected positive outcome. That's great. <laughs> yeah. We were also d talking about, like, from previous... Um, opportunities you've seen well over 10,000 applicants coming through I'm glad that I'm not the person that has to sort through each one of those yeah. applications that's a lot yes that would be very hard to choose from do the labs participate in the review for the candidates that have applied for their yeah. local yeah. so they are the ones that do all the review so I don't really review them at all personally um, each of our labs has a coordinator that goes through and works with their mentors in-house and they review the applications, and they are the ones that choose the students for the app, the uh, internship opportunities. And then we send out the um, acceptances or the offers in usually January through March as they go through all of the applications. Um, paid, right? The, yes, they yeah. are paid internships, and awesome. students usually start between May and June, and and participate throughout the summer. Awesome. Yeah, and we have just about anything that you can think of that the Navy does. So we have ocean sciences, we have ocean engineering, we have um, medical, we have a, a naval archaeology, so Naval History Heritage Command. It does archaeology work. Um, and none of those which require you to have any affiliation whatsoever with the Naval. That is correct. Or, or owe them anything. No. Yeah, that is correct. So yes. you do not have to enlist in the Navy. You do not have to do boot camp. <laughs> These are internships, civilian internships, um, non non enlisted, um, but on Navy uh, sites. So Navy and this is a, as long as you're in a student status. That is correct. You're eligible for this. It doesn't. There's no age. Kind there's of no uh, age limit. Yeah. No. Um, we've had folks that have gone back to school and and applied and uh, participate. Um, after sort of a for sort of a traditional um, uh, a academic timeline, but I actually so caught Dr. Ballard applying on the oh website. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So well, we would love to have that him. That would be amazing. <laughs> the local lab. Oh my goodness. I'm sure he's probably passed through more than one of our labs. <laughs> probably so. Yeah. Jason, good morning. How are you this morning? Hey, good morning. Uh, I'm Jason Fay. I am happy to be aboard Nautilus. This is going to be a great expedition. My role is uh, expedition leader. So that's like a uh, lead logistical planner <laughs> and problem solver, I think, for the different departments. Uh, it's been a delight with this group. Wearing many hats. Oh, yeah, it's been uh, just really, really dynamic. And and it, 
this expedition is a bit different than our normal where we're going to some place that we we to to purely explore we we know some really coarse information about the site but we're going there to provide some char characterize the site and some detailed information so the science community can pounce on that uniqueness and learn more for this expedition we're heading to because it's a technology focused expedition and really stretching the legs of this camera system we wanted to go to sites that were known that could challenge our ability to capture an image model these sites so we're where we, we've been returning to some of the like the top sites in and around the main Hawaiian Islands. And then today we're headed out to McCall Seamount. Um, McCall's been previously explored. There's been two limited dives at McCall. It's been explored by the Hawaii Undersea Research Lab with uh, a double submersible, dual submersible dive on the uh, eastern flank of McCall. And then the Okinawa Explorer with a remotely operated vehicle explored what looks to be a very um, sharp peaked feature to the north of McCall. And uh, we've been looking at that information. It's, it looks like we should be into some exciting terrain. But for us, for the first time, at least on this expedition, we're going to the western side of McCall. No one's took a peek over there. There's right. a couple of really steep features and a, a saddle that we'll fly through with the ROV. And so... Who knows, you know? I think it's gonna be the terrain based on the bathymetry is is going to be steep and rugged, but the amount of biology sometimes is uh, is driven by currents and other things, and, and it could be distinctly different from the eastern flank of McCall. And so we may get into like massive amounts of wonderful, you know? But or vast amounts of nothing. It also could be just like really gnarly terrain and uh, we get to enjoy the geology. So There you go. Uh, yeah. Looks like in 2016 they did some uh, coral collections. Are we going to be doing any collections, any sampling of anything? Uh, I don't think so. We're prepared to do a bit of uh, geology sampling, just a little just bit, uh, but that's going to be uh, if the conditions are right and we'll see when we get there. We had a little bit of rain this morning. Yeah, it's always nice to knock the salt off the uh, yeah. off the deck with a little fresh water. I was rinse. taking pictures of the sunrise, and I I scanned a little bit to the left, and I was like, "Oh, there's some rain coming." I wasn't sure which direction it was coming, and then when I came out of my meeting this morning, everything was wet. Yeah, we had a while we were having our little morning huddle. Uh, we had a rainbow right off of the yes. social deck, and both ends of the rainbow were terminating on the water surface it right was, there within view. It's a view. beautiful picture. I'm yeah, so yeah. happy Madison shared that with us. Yeah, maybe that can make it onto the Oh, website. for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So, Robert, how long to the bottom? I can. Uh, I guess I can do the math myself. 35 minutes. 35 Copy. minutes. 35 minutes. That's not bad. Yeah, so that put us at 10 o'clock, about 10 o'clock on the bottom Hawaii time. So we may have to save this question for Jonathan. He hasn't come back yet, but someone would like to know, how does the placement of the stereo camera set up the impact of the ability to collect other samples, or will this just be taking pictures and mapping sonar? And we know we have the capability of doing a sample if we need to. But does the camera system, with the basket not being there, really limit what it is that we're able to to collect? It does. It purposefully the cameras are uh, going to be on the forward edge uh, if you've been following along from previous dives on this expedition we've had them on the forward edge of the porch which is that lower structure in here Robert's Got a good feed extending in, uh, uh, the cameras into view one. on a sat feed one yeah uh, but currently they're mounted on what is typically um, a storage box a, the bio before bio box and uh, we've taken the bio box off and we've got the cameras mounted there uh, to act to serve as kind of two eyeballs. There are 180 degree fisheye lenses on each, and these will be stitched together uh, to collect, to produce a completely immersive 220, 240 degree image when it's complete. Um, for this, today's dive, we're going to focus on photogrammetry. So these cameras will actually be taking images every, like a, it's an image every three seconds or three images every one second. And when the camera boss gets up here, we'll, We'll figure out how I was it's watching them configured. yesterday take the placement of like it seemed like the Minecraft game. It was like like all these little individual cubes that they were just stacking as they were building the images to create that 3D effect. Is this um, 
was this down in the data lab? Or yeah. So there's another, uh, so two things going on. We have Jonathan running the camera system, which is the sensors that you can see in the satellite feed here. But above those on what looks to be like a large metal bumper on top of Hercules, that's a, they've got probably a dozen different lights. Here we're gonna, maybe we'll get to see it here. A dozen different lights mounted that illuminate the scene. There's also, there we go. There we go. So that is the, you heard us maybe talk about it yesterday. This is a, a multi-beam sonar. Uh, runs it between 200 and 400 kilohertz, and it is uh, made by a company called Norbit. And so uh, we have, we're have we lucky to have on board Chris Krasnowski, who has done a bunch of custom software development to help us visualize this multi-beam data. And so with Chris on board, we've really pushed to use this on a number of the dives, and it's it's really become a a key leading indicator of where certain types of terrain might be and oh there's something interesting over there and it gives us a three-dimensional perspective of the acoustics of um, the seabed that's different than kind of the uh, the piloting multi-beam that the ROV pilots use that just gives like a obstacle avoidance like what's directly in front of the ROV. This you get to see a much wider uh, perspective and Chris has got the visualization where it's almost near real time right mm -hmm. where we can we can use that to help and so as soon as today's dive uh, the spot we're going to land we're going to head down slope into the saddle and we'll map our way down then we'll have that map available to plan the individual really interesting target sites that we want to to explore as we head back up the slope and so this is just a really really great great tool and, and i'm so excited for chris as he continues to refine the software and the development path for this that it can be come more and more routine. Yeah, I listen to him talk. It's like literally a whole nother language. He's just getting all of his information out there and the fact that he can Yeah, I might catch a little things. of it, but I just feed off of his energy. Yep. He's so excited about it. Absolutely. And just, whatever we need to do to enable him to, to continue those. I managed to vibes. grasp that the uh, brighter the red, the closer we were to the sur or to the surface of the of the or to the ground. Yeah. And then as the colors went from yellow to green to blues and pinks and purples, the further we, or the, the deeper uh, that particular area was oh, yeah, it looks like, boy, we are just, we're already just early in this watch and we are, uh, as a watch team, we are really running at full speed here. We've got Pete switching sat feed three. This is the Norbit uh, running here. And, uh, and so, as you were saying, Devin, the yeah. typically the way we color the multi-beam maps to to help understand the depth, of it, just visualize the depth, is that the warmer red colors are de are shallower, closer to the surface, and the cooler blues and darker colors are the uh, deeper portions of that. And you'll see other people. It's it's a little bit of a personal preference and the kind of the the color chart that you use, um, but that's become kind of Nautilus's de facto. So folks who, if we share it online or whatever, folks kind of yeah. can be familiar. So we have someone asking, what is the deepest that we have ever gone using Hercules? Well, that's a good question for Robert. Got, yeah, we got a couple of different answers to that, depending upon which ROV we're using. I'm not really sure about that. We we must have a database somewhere. Uh, Herc's rated to 4,000. 4, 4, 4, yeah. 000. We haven't been to 4,000 so. with Herc. Yeah, so on the most recent, uh, well, I guess NA154, they uh, had an amazing expedition, and part of it was a um, maritime heritage dives at the Yorktown and two Japanese aircraft carriers that were sunk near Midway. And uh, those dives were deep. The, the wrecks lied in 5,000 meters of water. And so we had to configure, uh, the first plan was to use Little Hercules that, that is rated to 6,000 meters, but it had a technical issue as it was getting prepared to go in the water and we didn't have the spares uh, to dive with Little Herc. So we did uh, dive just with Atalanta, mm -hmm. and uh, Atalanta, which is the the 
a system that's rigidly rigid might not be the right word but uh is the Robert help me with the description here <laughs> dope is, on a rope <laughs> yes like, so there is a, a wire coming from the winch room connects to at Atlanta and then at Atlanta connects to Hercules on a very flexible uh, almost neutrally buoyant tether and Robert uh, that was a good one at Atlanta was was used to 5200 meters or something to image these wrecks and the footage turned out really quite good. compelling yes we uh, try our hardest to MacGyver fixes out here if we don't have the parts. But the the problem there with Little Herc was that the uh, the main junction box got some cracks in it and uh, was leaking. And it's that was uh, you know we could try and like patch that up, but going to 5,300 meters it takes you know a good three hours each way. So if you develop a big problem. You're not going to get it back up for a while. You need something yeah. more than duct tape, huh? Yeah. So <laughs> that was, yeah. There was no assurance that, you know, whatever we tried to do was going to hold. So we opted not to risk it. Oh, someone says a good way to describe it would be a tow sled. A what? A tow sled? Yeah, a tow sled. Yeah. Yeah. Which a lot of big discoveries have been made in that mode. So they found Lost City in the center of the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge using that. I had actually done an Alvin dive there the day before, and I think we found Lost City, but <laughs> they put, uh, was what was it? Uh, anyway, I forget the name of the vehicle, but it went down in the next day. And uh, like right off the bat, they saw these big pillars that we had seen yesterday the day before but yeah they that's where they found lost city which are some big calcite towers that are huge like 30 meters tall or something wow so what determines which rov you use for any given dive uh, so the question of what determines in. what which rov is used for any given dive Oh, there's no question that the combination of at Atlanta and Hercules in this two-body system is much more capable. You know, the, from imagery, the opportunity to collect samples, uh, all the sensors that Herc can host. Um, but when the cost of getting a vehicle like Hercules from a depth rating of 4,000 meters to, say, 6,000 meters, where we would, could have used Herc on uh, those carrier dives, is almost an exponential increase right everything yeah. is yeah uh one off and much more expensive and so you've really really got to understand the areas that you're going to explore and be sure that it's worth it to go through that expense and we're we're actually in that debate right now right hercules uh, just got a new frame and foam but a number of the components uh are in a discussion for replacement and it's and do you replace them to what depth rating, you know, and, and what's the f the future vision for where we'll be diving the vehicles? It's will there active, be a point when discussion. Hercules at, at some point will have to retire and a whole new system will have to be put together? Or just as we continue to dive, we replace as needed? Uh, Robert, you got a <laughs> thought there? Yeah, well, uh, the way we're doing it right now is kind of piecemeal. Yeah. So so yeah we just replaced the frame and the foam and uh this winter's maintenance period is going to be uh, a big hydraulic system overhaul so we're getting new hydraulic manifolds and i believe thrusters and actually looking at retiring our arms and getting new arms oh these are very old and beat up we have the oldest operating craft uh, predator arm there is. So. Robert, what's the point that you, um, it's no longer Hercules, it's something new because we replaced all the <laughs> right. original bits and pieces with, with yeah. new components. I, I don't know if that's really a thing because like if you look at Alvin, it's, it's, it was originally built in the 63, I think, 63 or 64. 
and it's still called Alvin, but there's not a single piece on that submarine that's original. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so maybe Herc will be an enduring presence then. Yeah. The and someone else has described at Atlantis as a wave shock absorber. Yeah, it decouples the motion of the ship from yeah. from uh, from Herc. But you know, if you're just using it by itself, that's kind of the the bad thing about that is that it's it sees the full motion of the ship, so it's bobbing up and down. So you can't get in too close to things because you can run into them as the ship's heaving. Uh, there's there's ways to mitigate that with uh, with like an active winch. The heave compensating winch, or with a uh, a separate system that's a heave compensator that takes that motion out of the wire, but we don't have anything like that. Yep. So someone's writing in saying it's like their favorite broom handle or their broom that they've had. They've replaced the handle or the head 20 times. <laughs> yeah. and just keep going with the same thing. It's still, yeah. still yeah. the same broom. Yeah. This is, this is a, it's a long-term philosophical question. Um, for the, the, sheep, the ship of Theseus where across a series of battle, Theseus' ship suffered more and more damage and they had to replace more and more parts on it. And the philosophical question, which is much more of a identity question over time, is if you replace all of the elements of a thing, is it still the same thing? Ooh. Hi, Jonathan. Good morning. Welcome back. Well, thank this you. Is we Jonathan had a question Feely, for you thinker. earlier. Oh, know, deep thinker. Ooh, get it? That's very apropos for deep sea work. I'm actually more of a shallow water thinker, if I'm <laughs> quite honest. I mean, Nautilus is sort of going through the same process, right? We got, we got a whole new main engine, and yeah, know, like, what was the old engine called? We called Thor. it Thor. 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 You, you could actually hear every, every, thump of the piston. Oh wow! <laughs> yep. I remember a tour of the engine room, and they uh, they had a spare piston hanging like on the wall kind of up in the overhead and it looked like a 55 gallon drum yeah <laughs> it was it just blew me away how large it was six cylinder right inline six yeah. cylinder so someone would like to know if you've ever seen a great white shark on a dive i've never seen a great white i have not either that'd be pretty Negative. rare yeah white tip sharks i think are our most uh, yeah. seen shark right yeah, the biggest sharks we see are the six gills, so they're, they're pretty big. And those those are bottom sharks, right? Yeah, those you tend to find those at the base of a escarpment. They like to hang out down at the base of them for whatever reason. Yeah, I we think do. we would all be willing to see a great white shark. We have uh, the Molokai Canyon site, which is on kind of our approved list, uh, was noted on the hurl dives that they have these. They, there's actually a and maybe we can send out a link to the YouTube video from the hurl dive, but this six gill shark just um, right in the front of the submersible. We use that clip very often when we're doing our, our live feeds with our interactions. It's amazing oh, really? how close from, that is. From the hurl dive? From, mm -hmm. oh, from yeah. the imagery, yeah. Well, we've, That's great. we've had a lot of six gills encounters. They, they, they're pretty curious. They tend to like hang around and see what you're up to. Yeah, ditto for the human body. Our cells are constantly being replaced. So we're still the same person as we right. were decades ago. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Have we ever used Herc and Little Herc at the same time on the same for a tandem dive, someone would like to know? I don't, so the, there's kind of a suite of vehicles that can operate as uh, one portion of the two-body system. So like at Atlanta and Argus are kind of the heavy connected to the wire that comes off the ship and are affected by the heave of the vessel. And then Little Herc and Big Herc 
are would connect to either one of those uh, two uh, sleds, and so they're not necessarily interchangeable. Maybe, maybe Bob and shallow water we could do some sort of hybrid uh, dive, but that maybe, I don't. The little herc's not that little though. You know, it's more like medium herc. It's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's still a pretty big vehicle. It's not like it could sit on the porch of Hercules, and you know, I think that's what people are kind of envisioning. Like, there has been dives like that done. You know, off of like off of Alvin, they flew a little, uh, a little ROV off of the science platform off of Alvin. Hmm. But um, yeah, little Herc's way too big to be on, like going for a ride on Big Herc. I think we've done some dives with leaving uh, Argus or Atlanta sitting on the deck and just launch Herc. We actually dove like in three meters of water off of Catalina. Yeah, I was, I was, I was on <laughs> that. <laughs> but and people were standing on the back deck, pointing, it, just pointing out where to go. Yeah, we could have. <laughs> yeah. We kept backing the ship in and backing the ship in, and uh, if we had a projector, we could have projected a movie almost oh, onto yeah. the cliff there. We were right up there. <laughs> huh. That sort of stuff happens when Dr. Bell is on board. Otherwise, it's a uh, you know, the captain standing there looking at Dr. Yeah. Bell, and he's like, "It's your ship. You want to, you want to keep going?" Quite a few people that have uh, written in saying that as they continue to watch over the different expeditions that we've been, um, hammerheads, Greenlands, white tip reef sharks, cookie cutter sharks. So I'm asking you all to speak that into existence so that that happens on this dive as well. I'd love to be a part of that. Yeah, I've never, a lot of those I haven't seen. No, I'm. Cookie cutter shark would be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> or a, what, a goblin shark? Those look pretty cool. Those creepy. are pretty cool. <laughs> Perfect time of the year for that, too. Yeah. Hello to the McCall clan of Burlington, Ontario, Canada. We're happy to have you with us today. We've reached our halfway point for sure. We're around, around 921 meters. Heading to around our max depth today of 1593. About 20 minutes to go. And uh, Pete. 20 minutes. The production Mac uh, is running now with uh, the Triclops view. OK. Yeah. So, so just I to keep you updated, we are headed to the me. western side of the McCall Sea Mount. I will try and walk us around. So I think this our speed's going to change. And yeah, you might have to slow down. The eastern side had previously been explored yeah. around 2016, so we're going to take a peek over to the western side. Go through a saddle and a sub peak and see if we can see uh, some maybe large corals, vertical walls, some interesting biology, hopefully. All those sharks you guys are going to hope for. This should be about an 11 hour dive today. And our science party line is open at nautiluslive.org. Please feel free to join in and send us a question, your comments. We'd love to be able to hear from you. Pete, I got a question for you. Approximately how big, oh, Pete. Pete's working video. Yes. Sorry. No worries. Robert, question's yes. for Robert. Sorry, I had to get my wits about me there. No worries. Um, how big are the different vehicles? So, if you're thinking about Hercules that we've got underwater now, would you compare it to the size of a smart car? <laughs> That's what I kind of think of. Yeah, about a tall smart car, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a lot taller. Like, what is it? Yeah, what is it? A little Volkswagen bus. Yeah. So, yeah, 3.7 meters long. 
Oh, there you go. You got the. You I got, got the, the specs cheat here. Cheat. I yeah. got the specs. Yeah, 1.8 meters wide, 2.25 meters tall. 6,500 pounds. A mail truck, yeah, that would be comparable for sure. Johan, what's one of the coolest things that you've seen so far as you've been on watch? Oh, um, I think my favorite things have been kind of the tech side of it, seeing Norbert and uh, the Triclops in action. Uh, it's pretty spectacular what those systems have been doing. Uh, we did a survey yesterday of a coral field uh, kind of mowing the lawn pattern, uh, and I actually haven't seen the model of that. I'm not sure how that turned out, but uh, yeah, it's just really cool to see these things in action and how quickly they can render some pretty incredible uh, visuals of what we're seeing. Thank you. Pete, on the video side of it, you, you've seen a lot. Is there anything that stands out? On this expedition? On or, this one? Uh, or in general? Easily, easily this expedition was getting stuck on that fishing rope and, and the magic that happened to get unstuck. That, that was, was incredible. I know there's been some spectacular scenery and I'm not diminishing the basalt structures and everything we've seen for the last uh, week or so, but that that was drama Yes. folding. Yes, it was. It the, was. We were down below looking at the control van and the level of attention. Now, to the ROV pilot, I think it was Dan. Dan, it's, yeah. It was just another day. And he's right. like, I don't know what everybody was stressing about. You know, we've done like, uh, you know, a dozen of those. Yeah, it was, some, it was some incredible footage. I agree with you. Robert, what were the challenges um, with that rope being free flowing in the water and that constant <laughs> the movement of the waves. Dan didn't tell me about that. <laughs> yeah. What would he what were some of the things you think that he had to to we, calculate? We had that happen a number of times unfortunately. Really? Yeah, it's uh, if you're working the top of a sea mountain, you know, I think it was around five hundred meters or something at the top, and you're you're kinda in a fishing zone, so and we all too often run into fishing gear. Yeah, so we've had to do that same sort of maneuver a couple of times. And we've also brought up like a whole string of fishing gear that we ended up spending about a half hour just bringing it aboard. And we ended up with a six foot tall, eight, 10 feet around pile of fishing gear. Wow. Yeah, it's, you can't see, you know, if you get a line that's up in the water column, sort of like draped across, you don't see it. You just, you go under it. Right. It, you know. So is that something that sonar cannot pick up then? Yeah, you, I mean, it's, you don't, it can be up, you know, 50, 100 meters up the cable, right? And then as you, as you're driving it and you're dragging it along, it'll come down and end up sitting like that one was on top of Atlanta and you know it's just, if it's if it's just stretched out like that it's not so bad because you can do like Dan had to do it back out from under it but it's it's when it gets you know wrapped that's bad yeah yeah so I've had to rescue a couple of AUVs that got hung up in fishing gear <laughs> How do you do that? You gotta cut stuff. So generally, you'll you'll find the the poor AUV at the end of the line, you know, dangling up in the water column. Oh. <laughs> it's all autonomous until suddenly it's not. Yeah. All right. I mean, it's like the robotic vacuum cleaners and your USB cables, right? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently the new r robotic vacuum cleaners are, are wise to the, those sort of things. I don't know how they do that. But. Little onboard sonars. Yeah. I think, it's, I think it's all video. 
I have one that detects a cliff. Yeah. Sends me a notification that they've detected a cliff. Well, the newest cliff. ones, they, they really? detect when, yeah. they, when your cool. dog leaves a little surprise and so they don't drag oh, that Oh, that's, <laughs> that's the worst. That's the worst when that happens. Could and you, you come imagine home, that? You're yeah. like, yay, the floor's clean. And then you just see this long, swerving streak. It was all good until <laughs> suddenly it was not. <laughs> yeah. So our maximum depth today will be 1,593 meters. We are currently sitting at 1,000. That's not the... Oh, that's the max? That's the max, but we're going to start shallower than that. Yeah. So we're okay. going to norbit our way down to probably that max yeah, depth and then work our way yeah. back up. So we're well, we're probably getting close. We're probably five minutes out from... You can speed up. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You got to stay with the delta there. Hello from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. I'm right up the road from you. Nice to have you with us. I'm in Clarksville. Yeah. I'm a yeah. science teacher at Kirkwood Middle School. Glad to have you with us today. Tighten up. They're flipped around, so I'm I'm on the upslope side. Have right. we used Little Herc at all this year on any of the expeditions? Only the attempt there. Almost. The, yeah, <laughs> Almost. Yeah, we were. It was all prepped to go, and, and then at the last minute that. That uh, crack appeared. So no, this we didn't use it at all. So not yet. That's one of my winter projects is to replace that, that junction box, which is a big project, really. What does the junction box That's do? Where all the all the wiring connects in there. Oh. So there's you know a few hundred connections in there. Well, it's not it's not trivial. Even if we had a spare box, it's like not something you would do at sea. It's, you know that's a week long project. We will redo that. Central nervous system. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, kind of the brainstem, you know. Definitely don't need any salt water in there. No. In fact, on, on Little Herc, the high voltage is also in that same box. So getting salt water in there and mixing the uh, low voltage equipment with the uh, 2600 volts would be rather disastrous. <laughs> so someone's know that's like the main electrical panel for the house? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that plus the transformer on the telephone pole at the street. Uh, yeah, is yeah, in the same box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and then mixed with seawater. <laughs> Aloha, Carter. Nice to have you joining us. Jason, is there a particular favorite moment that you've had either on this expedition or any other? You've seen quite a bit. Um, Anything that stands out? Uh, I guess I'll step away from maybe the ocean exploration stuff. The, the thing that is the most impressive and maybe heartwarming to me is the the folks who've never been to sea that are so enthusiastic about joining the ship and then with this you know kind of the mentorship and training that we have on board so quickly get up to speed and are an amazing contribution to the mission and that just that transformation you know yeah. uh, is is I think it's it is the most special part of what we do here you know yeah. because you can buy an ROV off the shelf and rent a ship and put it into some place. Shelf? That Target? <laughs> no, these are big, expensive <laughs> shelves, but yes, <laughs> in theory. And you could put that into a place in the ocean and take video with the cameras that were on it, and it would be similar. But the, the ability for someone else to grow this community 
you know, and, and pull in people of interest and share what we do. And uh, I think that is the secret sauce, right? And yeah. uh, that's what really makes it enjoyable for me. Is, uh, it is can be a little intimidating as, as someone that's coming on board for the first time to hear everyone talking so specifically in their field and, and to be so knowledgeable on that and then to be an outsider coming in, it can, it can make you feel a little bit like you just want to sit back and just kind of watch, but truly just at, everybody has been amazing about when I'm asking questions or wanting to learn. And I, that's exactly what you're describing. Yeah. It, and we're seeing that from the other side as well, because you guys have been um, just so accepting to every question and, and every everything that we've wanted to learn. So it really is a, a collaboration between yeah. everybody on the boat that makes the experience successful for sure. Yep, it's really, really special this whole uh, the idea of the core of exploration that dr ballard kind of founded the the ships the science parties around as being a part of this core of people who have experienced this and care about it and will keep it going yeah is uh, really something it is it's amazing yes do we Pick have any up. of the um any of the uh science interns on board on the SPL right now want to talk about their experience Humans an engineering intern and yeah. uh, similarly Johan is a uh, nav nav intern so uh, yeah maybe they could maybe Johan you came through a, a little bit unique path with some alumni from URI right I should cut this right yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, at home, at my PhD program at the University of Rhode Island, uh, my advisor is Dr. Brendan Phillips, who is a longtime alum of the uh, Nautilus OET family. And uh, I can speak on my intern experience, not a science intern, but engineering intern. Um, I just applied through the website. I had no idea I'd be like doing work like this. You know, if you asked me a year or two before I uh, I applied, um, yeah, and, and just from a Bob, program. how long we got? You think, Robert? How long? Oh, uh, we should start picking up Doppler beams soonly. Yeah. Couple minutes. Yeah. We'll yeah. We're about 150 meters off bottom. Yeah. So we'll see it on DVL here in a few minutes. First thing though is maybe that Norbit survey. So we're going to be standing off. You won't see anything in the camera. So that'll be about an hour, hour and a half. So Hercules is still descending. We're about. 1200 meters at this time so we're still looking at the water column 30 shades of blue not much going on except the occasional jellyfish that might swim by or the little fish we're just not going to be landing in the saddle we're going to be up on the peak and heading down and someone explaining on uh the message is that they're blind, and so it really helps if we use words that are descriptive. Awesome idea to do. I, ha I met with a group today Agreed. that were visually impaired, and uh, the young man that I was speaking with had asked me uh, what the ship was shaped like, and we talked about the shape of an egg, which I thought was pretty close, just a little bit more pointy at the top and a little more square at the end. I'd love to. I'd love to hear back from uh, that user. Where Where did you learn about our project earlier today? Yes, and absolutely. We'll do a great job, or um, be way more attentive. Thanks for pointing that out about describing what we're seeing um, throughout this dive. But where 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 did you hear about this uh, project recently? I did. Like I said, that meeting was today. It could have been someone that I met with this morning because I was oh. plugging in that dive. So it might have been. They were. Uh, we had actually a couple different places, Virginia, Pennsylvania, all kind of chiming in at the same time for that live. Um, be curious to see if maybe it was one of them. That would be awesome. They came back to visit. Yeah. Why is the port 
stereo cam so blurry? Um, part of the, so I actually have the two stereo cam set up in two different configurations right now. The uh, starboard, um, the starboard camera is set to be zoomed in, so it's a more, what's called a rectilinear view. So instead of being, uh, instead of having a field curvature and being able to see that full 180 degree circle, I've actually zoomed in. Uh, the zoom, the, the lens itself has this zoom functionality to have more detail in the center portion of the image. Um, the port camera that you see is still the full 180 degree fisheye. Um, just for this dive and just for general um, situational awareness of the pilots and the rest of our viewers, I've actually sent it to be transparent against the background. So that's why it appears to be just a little bit fuzzier than the rest is because it's actually, uh, uh, there's a fancy transparency going on so that we can still that see the view of the cinema camera as we go down. Uh, well, we're almost, we're almost there. So you gotta get the stick out of there and just go manual. Hey everyone, so we are starting to see our Doppler reading at the bottom. We're about 100 meters off. Um, at this time, I'd like to focus our conversations on operational stuff as we get situated on the bottom, and then we can jump back into the good stuff. Sure thing. Yeah, you can still keep the delta down because uh, you're in deeper water than me. So. And we're stretched out, so, yeah. You can keep it like 10. on bottom. Okay, 
You want to start moving towards me? Bottom in sight. Bottom in sight. Okay, great. So. <clears throat> yeah, we can do white bones. So Dr. Ballard had a little request while we're here to do uh, just a quick visual of the bottom before we come up to start the Norbit survey. So once you guys okay. get settled out, that'll be the first. We'll just do the white balance and then we'll... They got to move the ship closer because they're stretched out. Copy. So we can maybe do all that at once here. We start a move and we'll, I'll do white balance. You want to move closer to Herc's position? Yeah. Roger. Bridge, bridge, nav, one five at two six zero, please. One six zero, please. Do a quick color check. Oh, we got new tape. the button it's going to go dark for about 10 8 to 10 seconds or so oh we have some uh, interesting creases in the tape there all right. we don't have the big wide tape okay unfortunately. all right yeah all uh, we have is the little skinny stuff so can't get what you get you know i think i'm going to forego white balance today i don't want to mess it up because those shadows okay. actually could impact it so i'm going to go with the last preset okay yeah, we need to uh, hunt around for different white tape then. Okay. Or do something different with the car. That's what we have. No worries. Thank you. So for those of you watching, we were doing our color check. That's the craft. Yeah. You saw Herc's retractable arm. That's not that bad a number, even though it's red. I'm, I can live with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, the alarm point is at one meg, and 100 K is sort of bad. 100 K? Yeah. Okay. So. Hey, Bob. Lower number is being worse. Yep. Hey, Robert, can you turn off the down lights, please? Yeah. And uh, I pulled the cameras back in, so maybe you want to yeah. figure out where you want those. Where do you want those? Uh, just uh, roll them out, please. All the way? <laughs> yeah. There you go. And okay. is the porch retracted all the way? Now can you retract back the cameras sure. until you see the porch again in that uh, fisheye lens? Is that keep I mean, going. I, I see something. Now nah, keep going. That's just occlusion from that bright light on the lens. Oh, okay. Well, little forward. 
the other Ford. The other Ford? Push, push, push oh. the bio box out just a little bit. Uh. There you go, perfect, thank you. Yep. And uh, down lights off when, when you're down ready. Down lights off. Ah, it's perfect, I love it. Thank Good. you. Yep. Uh, actually, we want to look at the bottom though. So you have the mids on. Yeah, I agree. We're going to go to the bottom first for a, a visual oh, sorry. inspection, then we'll start the Norbit. Okay, going down there. Going. So if I can turn that light on so we can see what we're doing. Sorry. Is it possible to put an orbit on satellite? Yeah, I'm bouncing between Norbit and uh, Triclops right now, so since we're at bottom, I'm Thank just kind of getting a little variety back and forth, so. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Jason. So the plan is just to do a quick visual, and then we're going to go back up and do an orbit survey, correct? Uh, we we just couldn't help but be curious to, to put an eye on the bottom here for uh, just a few minutes. Um, exactly. Yep, so we're going to... This all looks as, as expected, uh, and so... Johan, the, the plan will be to, to whatever the optimal height above bottom for the Norbit, and then conduct a survey okay. uh, downslope to the waypoints that we've identified. And uh, Dr. Ballard's sitting here next to us. It may, uh, we may have a, a slight excursion while we're to continue that. Exciting. Copy that. So is K2 in the data lab? Sorry. Yes, K2 okay. is standing by. Um, I'm going to give you pilots when we're ready. I believe would our you rather have altitude is three zero meters. Roger. We're good yep. with his bottom view. We're Robert, this looks good. Thanks for the okay. putting up. eyes on. This is going to coming up. Be good. What's the uh, bearing we're going to go on? Uh, we will be going at about zero to zero degrees. Uh, but for now, to get to uh, the first waypoint, uh, our starting point, you have to go at about three, five, zero. It's kind of about here. Oh, we, oh yeah, we're going down slope. All right, oh. Robert, how far off the bottom are you right now? You want to go auto depth? Right. You just don't want it bouncing. Okay. Maybe we could play with the gain on that too, but yeah. 
Okay. You got auto hit on? Yeah. You're good. Okay, I gotta spin around though. I gotta wrap in the Roger. So we did have a write back in that Maryland State Library for the Blind and Print Disabled program. It's pretty awesome. So glad that you could join us today. Hercules is not sitting on the bottom of the ocean floor. We continue to float a few meters above as we begin to work up a slope or across the saddle of the seamount. We try to keep a good distance, use those cameras to our advantages. Hi, Dave's in video for a while. You want to come up? I'm getting close to you. Jonathan, do your cameras have a maximum depth capability before the pressure becomes too great? Isaiah yeah, wants were, to know. These were rated out to um, 6,000 meters. 6,000 meters. Uh, which that, is was, that was so that we could place these on any one of our ROVs. Little Hercules is rated to that full 6,000 meter depth. Nice. So we can change them into other ROVs re or place them onto other ROVs and then be able to have that same system set yeah, up and absolutely. go a little deeper than what Hercules is able to do at 4,000 meters. Absolutely, that's correct, yep. So the camera system is quite a load on uh, little Hercules, right? <laughs> Can imagine. Oh, you guys did. <laughs> you did such a good job, though, with that skid. It looked yeah. amazing. A shame. Maybe, maybe we'll be able to use it next year. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was an impressive feat of engineering, getting the camera system on Little yeah, Hercules. That was a big disappointment that we didn't get to use it. That would have been amazing doing that. Yeah, truly. The aircraft carriers with a full system. Okay, so three five zero. Uh, our heading will be zero two zero. Zero two zero. We have Norbert, our map it, mapping system that's working for us uh, on today's mission as well, giving us a good uh, outline of what it is that we can see from the bottom of the ocean floor using our sonar beams. From that, we'll be able to make a, a scale model and use the 3D technology that we have with the photogrammetry that we're taking to piece together some virtual reality, which is going to be awesome. Oh, We've I can't wait. some of the pictures that you guys have already put together, and it's amazing to see the 3D model. Really makes you feel like you're right there. Yeah, uh, we also got a working in a VR headset last night. Oh, did you? Uh, yeah, it looks so cool. Oh, it's so I must have fun. gone to bed before that happened. It's so much fun, yeah. Well, we'll have that up uh, on... Uh, the social deck hopefully tonight oh, to explore great. a couple of 
couple of the really cool models. Did we use this system during uh, the At Atlanta dive on the Midway dives? Someone wants to know. Did we have this up and ready to go then? This is this was up and ready to go. That's what we were just discussing. Um, the ROV team did an incredible job um, being able to push this system, which is which is quite large for a little Hercules. It it really is um, three big bottles plus a networking bottle. What's happening here? You got to get your Delta. Um, designing a uh, pretty awesome uh, sled on the bottom of Little Hercules to carry this camera system. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, when uh, Little Hercules ran into some problems, uh, wasn't able to dive, we, we were not able to use this uh, camera system on um, on the, the Midway Delta cruise. Like, uh, Atalanta is really not set up so. to take anything except for the existing camera that it has. Okay. So next mission. Next time. There's Next always time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, are you ready to start our Norbert surveying? Sounds good. Let us know. Johan, are you planning to like one continuous move? Just keep chugging along? Yeah, it's okay. about 330 meters to our next waypoint. So I was going to have them track a line forward and move all. Once we're near there, kind of alter a little bit towards waypoint one. Yep, sounds good. We have a viewer wondering if it would be possible for Hercules to carve a pumpkin with that knife use that we had the other day. We'd be able to get a pumpkin out of the deal. <laughs> uh, I think uh, Herc could damage a pumpkin <laughs> in, in accordance with... <laughs> it, it might be more in line with the smashing of the pumpkins post-Halloween than... Uh, I imagine you could only go so far before the pressure would do an, an implode of the pumpkin. Yeah, we don't. We'd have to fill it with water or something first, yeah. you know. Get all the air. It would be fun to see, though. I can I can picture the those arms doing the carving process. It was. Uh, yeah. If you've yeah. been reading the the hurl, the Hawaii Undersea Research Lab uh, pilot reports, it seems like one of their exploration strategies was to deploy bait and then to sit and watch what comes to it what for a number yes. of these. They um, did this on this particular mission. I was reading that. that they yeah, I've seen it come up a number of times. Yeah. And so, uh, That's probably how they got to see those sharks. I don't know if the pumpkin would be that much of a, <laughs> a of an bait interest, of attraction. Yeah. <laughs> we'd, we'd have to find some reason to legitimize it. But We did do stores before the expedition, and no pumpkins came through the line. Yeah. So, <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> have someone that's asking if we can explain what each graph is representing on channel three on our satellite feed. Okay, the ship is starting to move. Right. I think as soon as we get the survey rolling, maybe Chris can come on from the data lab and describe. Yeah. We're still working at getting the tweaks the, together and things. getting our location just right so that we can begin this mapping. Um, but we will definitely be happy to explain that to you. How fast do we check in? Point three? Point three. Devin, did we hear back from how the uh, visually impaired viewer? We did. Viewer we absolutely did. Maryland State Library for the Blind and Print Disabled Program, and I'm I'm pretty sure that those are the the folks that I spoke with this morning. Oh, great. W yes. I've got to. If you could make sure you remind us and like pull out of us maybe some details as we're describing these things absolutely. that that can help you know paint that mental picture for someone who 
uh, isn't able to view the screens. We. It made me uh, think of, uh, we've been talking about, we have a 3D printer on board and we were, we were discussing this morning and I think the lab is, is working on it, printing the columnar basalt formations and, and how our ability to, to model these things could make the, now with additive manufacturing and 3D printing, someone could print what we're talking about, literally Absolutely. the model of it, and then have some way to understand the complexity or the uniqueness. And a perfect place for that to take yeah. place would be at a facility for like that, because um, these folks are definitely interested and curious and um, it joining us and, and being a part of the expedition. So it would be great if we were able to provide them some sort of an opportunity where they could feel what they see, what they're feeling. Let's, uh, if they're willing to drop a point of contact into the chat, I think we can uh, maybe have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation and maybe share some of the models that, like a model that we do in real time from this dive, potentially. Absolutely. We I have could, the contact information from this morning, so I can yeah, definitely we send could, an email for we that. We could share the link if something like 3D printing or some other resource is available. Maybe that could be a really nice story to... Uh, something that we didn't expect as an added value for this modeling Absolutely. Effort. All right, I'm underway. All righty. <laughs> I, I don't play games like that. <laughs> It's not a competition. So for the viewers, this is going to be the view for, uh, I don't know, Johan, what do you think? We've got maybe 45 minutes of this Norbit survey, something like that? I'm trying uh, to hold the uh, constant altitude. For you. So yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, I we're, know. it may look like we're kind of still ascending or descending. We're actually conducting a multi-beam survey of the seabed. Uh, this is really informative, not only because it will highlight uh, changes in the terrain that we can then um, go investigate, but also there's a bunch of different sources of information that come out of the multi-beam survey. And one of those is the intensity of the acoustic return as each ping is sent to yeah, the seafloor. And that intensity, really, not critical. Uh, you can make some association to the softness or hardness of the seabed. And so that's also interesting. So when we can look at the multi-beam survey, understand the terrain, but then the backscatter, which is this intensity measurement, to understand potentially what the makeup is, we can even be more targeted with where we go uh, on on our excursion as we're coming up this this ridge. And so this is really it's a value added 45 minutes for to do this survey because we'll be much more effective in our exploration for the coming hours after that. And if you're watching live, that satellite uh, feed for camera number three uh, would be all that imaging that you see they're constantly working on and um, making sure that they have their program running exactly as they need to. All that data is gonna be collected and turned into a 3D visual experience, which is gonna be amazing. I had someone just write in that a really full, great idea for a full sensory activity would be to have that 3D model yeah. and then place it underwater so that they're literally feeling the water that's around as well yeah, just to yeah. make that full connection. That would be a really neat idea. I like that. Yeah. So, Let's Jason, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Yeah, uh, go ahead. I just did that quick calculation and it looks like we have about 20 to 22 minutes to a waypoint two and then another 12 to 15 to our final point. So 35 minutes to yeah, 40 sounds good. is our estimate. Yeah, perfect. Time well spent. Mm -hmm. If maybe the folks in the lounge on the ship could keep uh, resupplying K2 so he can be actively chomping away at the, <laughs> at the Norbit. <laughs> That would be most helpful. He might need his laundry switched or something. Who knows? But he has snack eye. There was a really big bag of Cheerios down there. I wondered whose that was. Is it in the it's data probably lab? snacking away. Yeah. yeah. Did I just hear that K2 needs a snack?
<laughs> Those Cheerios are Justin's. From the previous exhibition? Oh, so they're fair game then. That's great. <laughs> no, snacks and uh, comfort foods and ice cream seem to be the big, you know, big things that really affect morale. That ice cream hit pretty well the other day. It we was really nice. We only get ice cream on Sundays. Only <laughs> ice cream on Sundays? Only Sundays. Only Sundays. Whereas Sun if you go Sundays to make Sundays. There's an ice cream freezer with Hagen Dazs bars. Oh. <laughs> oh, I will Same. say, though, <laughs> they were great cookies out in the mess yesterday afternoon, if anyone And they're gone chance. in like 20 minutes. So, yeah, the, 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 the butter was the very first thing I tasted in those cookies, and I was like, oh, I'm going to have to eat this slow so I can savor every bite. I, I saw Dr. Good. Ballard at least three times swiping cookies. He was, he like was, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> so I don't think he's overindulging. He loves to come up to the van and, and take care of the watch section. So no, he was definitely, it was, he was in the lounge. He was watching, he was focused and just <laughs> enjoying. And I, I loved it because he was just like, eh, is anybody watching? Uh, it's good to be the king, I guess. That's yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Someone post, glad I'm not the only one who snacks on Cheerios. I think cereal makes a great snack. We are we are very lucky to be so well taken care of on Nautilus. Oh, the, yes. The chef and the stewards all do such a fantastic job with the... There's always healthy options. There's comfortable options. There really there's, is. Got you know, a wide variety. Yeah, you can. All your dietary kind of concerns. They take really particular attention to all that. It's nice. I know we post uh, frequently on Nautilus.live or Nautiluslive.org in regards to. Um, our missions that we have coming up. Do we have a place where, because someone's asking, saying they always miss the lives are, wanted to know if we, we post a specific schedule so that they can kind of tune in in advance, plan for, for it. For dives? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. And there's a, a good reason. Uh, uh, this expedition might be more schedule driven than most. I mean, most of the time we're planning to get to the site of interest and then dive for as long as it takes to kind of complete the mission. And, and that could be a day, day and a half in the water <laughs> for the uh, vehicles. Tell me to quit trying to go auto. But then the weather comes up and you get blown off. And, and I what think... About and I know we've I'm had some, auto, some times auto, where... It would do more damage if folks... Uh, looked at the schedule, tried to count on it, and we let them down. Yeah. Then okay. this sort of like, like we know, like a quick social yeah. media post, we're diving now, and then they get a, alerted, and then can join in if they have the opportunity. Uh, max velocity. And we do through Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, try to alert you guys as much as possible when yeah. we have a dive coming. That way you can prepare for it. But there are a lot of factors that we have to consider in with the timing. And definitely I, I, maybe don't I'm want to a little disappoint. biased because it feels like that would be another thing that the expedition later would have to do, and I'd be oh. like, <laughs> I have to, I update the whiteboard. I'm like, and then I've got to update the old interwebs with the schedule that's changing. So maybe that's just my. But we do try to post as often as we can on the Nautilus Live uh, website. So please get back and yeah, check absolutely. that as frequently as possible. That'll give you the most up to date. Yeah, and the socials are the best. Yeah. And if folks hear things that we're discussing or potentially committed to doing, like talking about a model of this area or that, and you want to see that, please cue us because we likely have that data can make it publicly available and uh, we can send that out on the socials too so folks can um, enjoy. So I get another question coming in on average, how long are your missions and does all of the crews stay 
for each mission. So I can speak to that. So I work the 8 to 12 watch, and most of us in here are set on an 8 to 12, 12 to 4, or 4 to 8 watch. So we spread the wealth and allow everybody to stay fresh, um, get a time to relax, and we have other other missions that we have on board as well, things, obligations that we have to fulfill. But usually that four hour watch and uh, today's mission, we know that we're diving for 11 hours. So we'll have a shift change here um, at noon and then um, we'll finish up the rest of the day. So it just really depends on the mission. But The ships built were uh, organized to do 24 hour operations and that could be, uh, that can be extended into, you know, as many days as necessary uh, for the work. Uh, for this particular project, we're we're diving about 11 or 12 hours a day because the data processing is such a burden on the other half of the team and we want to learn from the output of that data processing before we dive the next day. We're, uh, we're diving kind of daylight 12 hours and then the, the evening, the night shift, is rocking in the data lab producing the products that we've discussed and uh, informing our next day's dive. So, this is, what an honor. Oh my goodness. And don't spoil it. We I don't want to eat it, I want to save it. I want to say, how do I say, how do I preserve this for forever? Don't spoil it. I think you have to take a photo. That's I how you absolutely how you have it. to take a photo, for sure. <laughs> oh my goodness. Now I have to, oh, I'm obligated to say because people are wondering what it is that I've got going on over here. I've just been delivered, hand delivered, personally, by Dr. Ballard himself, an Oreo, <laughs> to remind us of the, almost like the Oreo that we saw yesterday with the calcium carbonate and the lava that was on top. That's what we described it as. I heard you guys talking about that and a Lindell chocolate, sea salt chocolate at that. He's feeling guilty after... Eating those cookies yeah, yesterday? Yeah, that's right. This is a... <laughs> and it's much appreciated. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. I'm going to... Yeah. This is, a, this is a picture moment right I, here. I think the front row is getting left oh, out Oh, the front row. Would anyone like to share my Oreo? Pete, do you want half no. of the Oreo? Are you it's sure? Not, it's going out on so satellite Oreos. three. <laughs> oh. um, here, I can put it up. Um. Oreos are my favorite. It's the best, best they, they snack are pretty ever. good. They really are pretty good. Like the ones with the mint in the middle, or any double stuff of any kind. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Ballard. You're on camera now. Uh, yeah, with my Oreo. Look at this, my Oreo and my chocolate. <laughs> hey, Pete, what feed would be the, is the Norbit running on? So we Norbit is running here. on uh, PC3. Is that uh, maybe Data Lab 3? What's so looking on my, I don't. Uh, oh, uh, are, are you on KVM or are you looking on? KVM is actually called Norbit. Okay. So control Alt X and then look for Norbit. So I have a question of how many oh, meters or feet does the spread uh, the ROV capture Apologies, per scan? PC4, Jason. At the current depth of 304 degree angle. That sounds like a very technical question that probably Chris would have to answer. I will definitely flag that and get that back to you. Someone else asking uh, about the expeditions and um, how long they usually are. It just really depends on what our mission is. Um, the ship, uh, this, this particular uh, sail is two weeks long. We've had some that have been four weeks and of course longer, but it just really depends on what the mission is. And in particular, we were using the new camera systems. So um, we had a very short window that we had before we 
led off to the next expedition and what those would be used for. Robert, I have a question about Hercules and uh, at Atlantis. Someone wants to know if you can explain the amount of PSIs that they're both taking on right now. <laughs> you can uh, you whip up that math real quick? Yeah, it's like 1.46. No, I'm supposed to know that number off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I think it's 1.46 times the depth, okay. I think. By that math, at Hercules' current depth, that would be 2,071. 2,071 PSIs. Definitely are not carving pumpkins down here. But does that work out? So if you take, do the math. Robert, we're going to put the Norbit up for the uh, the Triclops camera just while we're doing the survey, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Thanks. Oops, i got to pay attention here. So we have officially been out for a week tomorrow uh, on this expedition and we're scheduled to come back to port on November 5th. This was a two week mission. And we've been lucky enough every day we had beautiful sunrise, beautiful sunset worth waking up for, worth staying up for. And Jason, had someone asking about whether or not we're gonna add the 3D model of the ROV uh, Atlanta, at Atlanta to the Sketchfab. I don't just see why not. I don't know if we have, but uh, it's if Argus is on Sketchfab, it's a scaled down version of Argus. Okay. So from a, if you like 3D printed it, yeah. you know, you'd still have a fairly representative example. Um, but but we can definitely look into that. I'll I'll jump down on the data. So we say they're this. they're sister sister vessels, sister vehicles. Yeah. At Atlanta and they're yeah. like. Uh, And someone else wants to know how them. much of the crew stays on board from one expedition to the next. So to make Nautilus sail on a exploration mission, you've got kind of two, two groups of people. We have the ship's crew who are more enduring over expedition to expedition to expedition. And, and they, they maintain the ship, the power plant and generators, the, plumbing, you know, the, they drive the ship and navigate safely. And then there's the science party, which is more expedition driven. And so there's a few of us that cross over um, between multiple expeditions. Because you were on the last mission, right? I was. Yes. Yeah. And like Rennie, who will be on um, uh, one of the watches, Rennie's, I, don't know, he, I think he mentioned he had almost 70 expeditions under his belt. So each season he's out for a couple and they could potentially be back to back. So he's a rookie. Uh, then. Yeah, he's a rookie. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, but there, there is this, uh, the ship's crew is 
more months and months at a time, and the science party is expedition to expedition. And there is some some crossover on both, uh, but but that's the way the rhythm of Nautilus personnel. So I'm around 135 expeditions. Wow. <laughs> 135? Yeah. I've been doing it for 27 years. Wow. Uh, that's awesome. So someone's asking about pressure experiments. Um, we know that obviously carving the pumpkin is out of the question at this point, but we do have something upcoming when we are going to be looking at taking some styrofoam down. Everybody on the ship has been decorating their own individual cups or little individual styrofoam pumpkins. Uh, and we do have a plan to actually do a little bit of an experiment to, to take them down. I think in the next couple of days we're going to do that. I think what we need for the, from the Office of Naval Research, and maybe Kristen, you can take this on board <laughs> as an action item, but we need a non-styrofoam, like cellulose-based cup that we could use for these demonstrations. I just feel off -row buying styrofoam cups to then just for this purpose yeah you know, it, it is it's great for the like a teaching tool yes. and to inspire kids but if there was a, a non-plastic kind of non-petroleum based thing we would invest in those you, you'd have you'd have 50 a used in expedition that we could take in the deep oh, ocean and the squish camera. we will have to look into that even tilting. See what we can oh, do you think that's do a that. six one initiative, a six two? You have all this certainly a attention. six one initiative, yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> the question is which lab do we send it to? <laughs> oh that's so it's okay. Maybe the naval research laboratory could to, could tackle that one. I almost feel like that could be something that we could you know, especially these expeditions that have a bit of a transit. You've got four or five days out to, you know, the Papahanamakuakea or whatever. And there was some chemistry set that we could pour and mold these things that would then that have these volumes of air in them and then when we bring them back up you know we could make like a whole thing of it potentially that would be fun we'll have to we'll have to start thinking about that yeah robert you're getting some kudos on your math someone's typed in it was pretty doggone good <laughs> 1445 meters I, that wasn't good enough, really. 2103.78 PSI. I should have that number in my head. Oh, yes. <laughs> we have about 125 meters to waypoint two, where we'll change direction but keep doing what we're doing. Hundred and forty five? Oh, would underwater popcorn be an option? With the pressure, I've been pop the corn. Auto depth and during the I think the, it's just uh, getting wet. Velocity. It would be just soggy. What if you put it in a bag? Well, Maybe. the bag okay. might. Well, I pop. could probably go out altitude and mess with the yeah. max velocity. I think the max velocity was probably what was messing you up. Before. So if we could figure out how to contain it. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So that's. Yeah, you, I think you got to change the max velocity so it doesn't hunt so much. So do you think there will ever be a possibility where we'll be able to do robotic drilling aboard the Nautilus? Uh, ab aboard the Nautilus and aboard Herc, uh, so there are small scale uh, drills that you can use to do like geologic experiments on the seabed that run off of hydraulics. Okay. And so that's uh, they're something that the manipulator could grab. They're they're very small, not like drilling into like a well that you would associate with oil and gas or something in your yard. And uh, but there are. Um, there are projects that do deep sea drilling to yeah, you, uh, I mean, it'd probably understand be better the, if I was just the, auto altitude the age of the tectonic plates and all kinds of other okay. uh, research initiatives. And so the IODP is one of the Googleable things that. Okay, we got to get there. Though. I think it's the do International Ocean 30? Drilling Program. This is a ship 
custom made to drill oh, to do holes in the ocean to, to understand, you know, and date reefs, but then also you know, all kinds of other things that I am well, uh, not an expert in. Down. But a uh, very substantial program for the IODP. And then uh, there's all kinds of stuff. There's, there is um, directional drilling rigs where you can, like, if you're, if you're going to pass a fiber optic cable from shore to sea, and you're going through that sea to shore interface, uh, not only can they directional drill from the shore side, but there's sea-based rigs that can that drill a hole that can ex that can uh, daylight up onto land. And so uh, deep sea drilling is definitely a thing. ROV Hercules is uh, probably possible for small scale drill operations. Like I wanna drill a hole in this rock to this depth to get through the manganese crust to then make some assessment of what the interior of this one small rock is. But like bashing a big hole in the sea floor isn't, yeah. isn't I, hurts. I was doing Z bias with Jam. It's, that's hard to know the number because we're going down slope. So, so this year you know? for the 2023 expedition um, run, we have yeah. 10 expeditions scheduled. Uh, expeditions I mean, it's hard for me to drive with Z bias scheduled what I'm doing, right? with funding, like which I can we set get. The Z -bias this particular neutral, mission is the Office of Naval Research funding. Yep. We appreciate that. Um, what percentage of the year do you spend out I mean, at right sea? Right now, it's trying to get to 30. So yeah, so I, I can take that uh, out and see what it does. Six months are funded by uh, NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration, and uh, and then. There are a one or two additional expeditions. This year we were lucky enough for the Office of Naval Research to support an expedition for this uh, stretch on the legs of the camera system. Um, and then National Geographic in the previous years has contributed for these sorts of ex an expedition. Uh, and then we've got a longstanding relationship Looks with like Ocean Networks Canada. So if you saw the ship uh, up in British Columbia working on the uh, you're trying to get rid of the, the there. wobble on the, uh, on the uh, We'll do that bottom. again next year. Yeah. Um, right. Here, let me just. But that's it. That. It's usually six months for NOAA uh, and then a month or two of other customers, depending on the season. We'll try and tweak it in. Our messages are going crazy with the popcorn idea. Yeah, yep. Do Someone wants to remind us that it's internal pressure, not external pressure, well, that would cause the right. pop. Mm -hmm. And then someone else also suggested we should send it down already popped and see how it comes back up. <laughs> Underwater popcorn, return sea salt it back flavor. To a, it re <laughs> return it back to its kernel state. <laughs> yeah. Right. It's a much lower frequency now. <laughs> Is that too hunty? Is it possible to use ground penetrating radar to determine minerals uh, with ROV and Herculating? Have we gotten uh, that is so that. there is a, and Dr. Mayer on the next shift can talk in more detail, but there is a chirp sonar that allows us to, it's acoustics, that allows us to understand the properties of the seabed down to um, a depth probably measured in meters, you know, three, five, ten, maybe. Um, but then you can see the layers of the, the strata of the seabed and soft and hard. Um, it's kind of a monochromatic display that comes back from that. And then uh, another project that we've had this year, we had, um, I think it was, we called it the laser dive bot. This was, and I'm uh, blanking on the name of the, Impossible Sensing is the name of the vendor. They're a startup. Um, oh, yeah, just do what you need. Startup I'll company I'll that is, was originally funded by NASA. And they have, uh, they use Raman spectrometry so to shoot this laser at the uh, 
hard substrate on the sea bottom, rock or whatever, and the signal that comes back off of that uh, can be analyzed to understand the makeup of that geology. So yeah, the original question, I don't know, maybe circle back on the original question, but I think it was related. <laughs> the, 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 uh, ground penetrating radar to determine minerals, yeah, the types I, yeah. of minerals that are there. GPR needs to be in contact with the surface, I believe, so you have to actually be on the ground for that to penetrate. Um, but Raman spectroscopy, actually, you can yeah, you can identify the chemicals in whatever you're looking at. So that would be a really interesting way to look at uh, the sediment and the, the rocks that we're flying over with the with the ROVs. So we're, uh, whoever wrote in that comment, we're thinking the same thing, wanting to have non-intrusive ways of understanding the uh, where we're exploring. You know, imagine if instead of having to her can only bring back a limited amount of samples right that can get sliced and analyzed for the the geologic composition now all of a sudden we could we with the laser dive bot you could sample hundreds of unique you know um, geologic samples on the seabed and then her could bring back corals or something that you couldn't analyze without bringing them back to the lab and so Really cool work there. I, we can't wait to see what impossible sensing. With Raman, you could potentially do some kind of analysis on the corals as well. Maybe not living samples, but yeah, yeah. You could definitely get the chemical, the chemis chemistry in those. Samples. Yeah, we got to put the laser safe goggles on the coral before yeah, exactly. we do it, right? And then, <laughs> then we're good. We can make sure. We So if you're joining us from nautiluslive.org or one of our YouTube channels, um, you'll see that we have uh, four feeds going. Um, satellite feed one is coming from Hercules. Uh, number We have three, okay. Number two is uh, from At Atlantis. Our third field is um, working right now on the uh, sonar mapping, so you're getting an image of what it is that they're looking at. It's very colorful with the different um, depths that we're picking up through the sonar. A lot of graphs that are running around, um, looking at meters per second and, and the depths that we have there. And then um, on our quad channel, you kind of get a view of each one of those together so you can kind of see everything all at once. Right now we're still looking just through the water column as we're headed down to our point, we should be getting very close. Johan, do we have a time frame that we're looking at? We should be getting right about there. Yeah, we are about 50 meters hey, out Devin. from waypoint two. Uh, maybe I just reached out to Chris in the day lab. Sounds like he's in a good place to kind of talk us through what's going out on oh. sat feed three. If, Perfect. Uh, if Chris, you're, if you're listening, if you wanted to jump in and kind of go through what we're seeing and what are some of the things, the knobs that you're turning and you know, your concerns or thoughts on how this is turning out. Yeah, happy to.